the Miami Hurricanes offense was really bad against the Clemson Tigers. How bad were they? You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. They were so bad that it's been 57 years since they've had fewer total yards than they had against Clemson. I am Alex Dono, your host. I'm a University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet, and contributor to allhurricanes.com. And thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. And I do appreciate you guys being here. Uh, despite the fact that for the sixth time this season out of 11 games, we are reacting to an L. And as several of them have been this year, this one was not close. And there's plenty of blame to go around from coaches to players to culture. There's plenty of blame to go around. Now, uh, you guys can tell me if it's unreasonable that parts of this game, I did feel encouraged. I, you set the bar kind of low when you have to say, hey, well, this was a lot better than the Florida State loss at home because Miami did fight specifically on defense uh, in the second half of this game. In the first half, there you know, really wasn't any fight or any execution whatsoever, but there were certain parts of this game that gave me some encouragement. But first things first, the talent gap is still very wide between these two programs. I remember thinking after Clemson beat Miami 59 to nothing in 2015, the end of the road for Al Golden, like seven years ago, I'm like, oh, I can't wait till Miami starts closing that talent gap with Clemson seven years later and, you know, three head coaches later, not including interim coaches. You know, the talent gap is still is still incredibly wide. And, and even though, you know, the Clemson of this year is not even as good as the Clemson of a couple of years ago, but it still isn't close. Outside of players like Cam Kinchins, Akeem Mesidor, and Leonard Taylor, who all played exceptionally well on Miami's defense, specifically in the second half yesterday, just about every other Miami player that took the field was not on the same level as their Clemson counterpart. Um, now, you know, some people were, were getting after me for tweeting something to this effect yesterday. Um, you know, I... No, no matter what, you know, a couple different starters here and there. Miami's not probably not winning that game last night. But I can't help but wonder how much closer the Hurricanes could have kept this game with a healthier offensive line and a healthy Tyler Van Dyke had he started at a quarterback instead of a true freshman. Uh, and yes, Van Dyke probably would have been chewed up by Clemson's front seven and their blitz even more so than your mobile starter did, but at least – Van Dyke could have hit some open receivers. Now, I'm not giving up on Jakari Brown after a rough start. His struggles were, a lot of it was to be expected when you send a true freshman to Death Valley for his second career start. Clemson's defensive line was able to expose Jakari Brown's weaknesses in a way that Georgia Tech last week was just not good enough to do. Right, because we all had the suspicion that if Clemson could force Brown to try and beat them through the air, unfortunately, he's just not at that level yet. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we'd probably still lose, but I wonder how different that game would have felt if Brown could have hit a wide open Xavier Restrepo on Miami's second offensive play. Nothing but green grass in front of him seemed like a very routine throw for a collegiate level quarterback. That would have been the easiest touchdown the Canes had scored all season. He could have walked into the end zone uh, from like 70 yards out uh, had that throw been on the mark. So at that point in the game, you know, Clemson had just marched down the field and scored on their opening drive way too easily, I might add. But at that point in the game, had Jakari could have hit that throw to X. The game would have been tied at seven and you would have just answered Clemson's opening drive. Instead, um, you know, you missed that throw. Miami had that 15 yard penalty on a would be first down conversion, third down conversion for a first down, I should say, on what I thought was kind of a soft call on a, a I'm, I'm going to do the uh, the air quotes uh, locked on Gator style here on a blindside block 
by Jalen Knighton. Basically, uh, you're not allowed to play football anymore. You could get a set, you could get a 15 yard flag if you block somebody who's not looking at you like they should be. Uh, it is what it is. So it, instead of tied it up at seven, you end up down 14 nothing in the blink of an eye. And again, I'm not I'm not saying Miami would have won the game, but the first half would have felt a lot different. Instead, Miami goes into the halftime locker room with just eight yards of total offense and a 24 nothing deficit at halftime. Now, uh, things got better in the third quarter into the fourth quarter. So Jakari Brown, who started this game uh, and, of course, started the second half, he did get replaced later in the game by Jake Garcia. But Jakari Brown, uh, early in that second half, first third quarter drive, comes out with a 40-yard run. Uh, mainly, though, it was the Miami defense that responded in a big way in that second half. They didn't force any turnovers in the first half. In the first half forced first uh we know clemson has been prone to turnovers they came in having turned it over nine times in their previous three games they did turn it over three times yesterday hurricanes forced three takeaways in the second half they gave their offense plenty of opportunities folks two fumbles one interception and most fun moment of that game for me was watching big jordan miller recovering one of those fumbles, the one that Mesidor forced, and trying to rumble that one into Clemson's end zone. He got down to the 10-yard line for a couple seconds there. I thought, he's going to score. The big man's going to score. We're going to get a big man touchdown here. I wish he could have run it all the way in. Uh, Miami did end up scoring after that takeaway, uh, but it would have been more fun to watch the defensive touchdown in that spot, I think. Uh, you know, Cam Kinchins, we talked about how well he played. He forced a fumble that DJ Ivy recovered. Ivy also had an interception in the game. Uh, and Akeem Mesidor has mentioned he forced the fumble that Miller recovered and nearly scored on. But the offense, the offense, the offense. Miami couldn't take advantage of those takeaways. Three takeaways, you turn them into seven points. And you kind of only turn them into five points. Because if you go by the net result of Miami's takeaways... DJ Ivy's fumble recovery happened at Miami's own nine yard line. The Hurricanes on the next play end up giving up a safety, poor awareness by Brown, should have gotten rid of the football. It was turned out to be intentional grounding in the end zone. So instead of getting points off of that takeaway, you ended up losing two points the next play after the takeaway. So that was tough. Uh, let me give out grades here for the offense and uh, and for the defense. I give Miami's defense a grade of a C. They got carved up in the first half. That's why the grade's not better than a C. 24 0. Clemson was basically doing whatever they wanted, uh, first quarter and a half. They got carved up in the first half. Second half, though, the Canes, D, they made enough crucial stops and enough takeaways to give the offense a chance to get right back in that game, and they couldn't. Yes, the defense, if you look at the stats, the box score never tells the full story, guys. But if you look at the stats, yes, the defense gave up 447 total yards to Clemson. But that sort of thing is going to happen when your offense does absolutely zero to compliment you. I know you guys have all heard the term complimentary football. There was none of that going on. The offense was not helping Miami's D whatsoever. Early in the fourth quarter, uh, thanks to all those takeaways, Miami was down just 26 to 10 in that game, and they had momentum on their side. They're down just two scores with the offense having a chance to drive and get the Canes right back in it. Uh, and the offense couldn't take advantage of it. And a lot of that was execution by the players on the field. A lot of that was coaching. OK, uh, but let's stick with the defense for a second. Cam Kenshin's. I thought he was Miami's best player against Clemson. Uh, you know, didn't have the highest PFF grade, but I thought he was the best overall player. 13 total tackles in the game, nine solo, one tackle for a loss, two pass breakups and a forced fumble. Uh, and I just, I love the way the cam is just finding a way to dominate games in different ways. You know, last week against Georgia Tech, he showed you how much he excels in coverage. And then against Clemson, you know, he was also very good against the run when really no other few other Hurricanes players were. Cam is a great athlete, yes, but Kinchins also works harder in the film room than just about anyone else on this team, and it shows. I wish we had 22 Cams on this team that studied and prepared the way that young man does. 
Uh, I thought Wes Besaint also had another very good game starting at linebacker, eight tackles for the true freshman. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of and two other guys who played well on Miami's defense and, and the PFF grades reflect that. Akeem Mesidor and Leonard Taylor had the highest pro football focus grades of any Miami players, uh, 85 for Mesidor and an 83.6 for LT. I also thought defensive tackle Daryl Jackson was also very good, a little you know less flashy than Mesidor and Taylor, but uh, Jackson, may, he missed zero tackles in the game, so his technique was very good. Uh, we need more guys like him on this team as well. So I, I give the defense a C. <laughs> That's a passing grade, I guess. I'll tell you what I gave the offense right after we talk about the awesome folks at Simply Safe. And spoiler alert, the offensive grade was not very good. But Simply Safe gets an A plus all the time. Guys, did you know that over the holidays, property crimes like burglaries and package thefts spike nationally? That's why our friends at Simply Safe Home Security are offering 50% off their award winning security system so that more families can feel safe and secure this holiday season. Order your Simply Safe system for half off today and enjoy advanced security and greater peace of mind this holiday season. Here's why I love Simply Safe. Not only are you protecting your house and your home, but you're doing so in the 22nd century. Guys, it is amazing the technology that they have where you can monitor your HD security cameras inside and outside your home right there on your smartphone, crystal clear HD feed of your security cameras. You get high tech security sensors all over your home as well. Simply Safe was named the best home security system of 2022 by U.S. News and World Report. And they got that for the third year in a row, by the way. In an emergency, 24-7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify that the threat is real so you can get priority police response. 24-7 professional monitoring service costs less than a dollar a day, guys. Less than half the price of ADT's traditional professionally installed system. Do not miss your chance to save big on the only security system that I recommend. Get 50% off any new Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com slash locked on college. This is their biggest discount of the year, so don't wait. That's simplysafe.com slash locked on college. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So uh, I gave Miami's defense a C. Miami's offense gets an F. I would give them an F minus if I could. Is that allowed? Like, do they do? If, if I if I was like a school teacher, I would be giving out F minuses and I'd probably get a, get a lot of trouble for that. Or I'd be giving out Zs. Can we give them a Z? So Miami's offense against Clemson, this is on players, it's on coaching, it's on everybody. Yeah, I can expect the offense to be bad when the O-line is down three starters and you have a true freshman starting a quarterback in a game like this. But it shouldn't be historically bad. I mentioned this is the worst offensive output in 57 years for the Canes. Miami finished this game with 98 yards of total offense that's their lowest output in a game since 1965 <laughs> I have no idea who was coaching the team in 1965 I know it wasn't Schnellenberger wasn't even Lou Saban I'm sure Larry Bluestein, if he's watching or listening can tell me who was coaching in 1965 I don't know who it was but yeah um if Jakari Brown so like I said players and coaches okay if Brown could have hit a wide open Restrepo for a walk in 73 yard touchdown. It wouldn't have been historically bad. If Jaleel Skinner had caught a really well placed pass by Jake Garcia for a late first down that could have led to a scoring drive, it wouldn't have been historically bad. Now, let me talk about Jakari Brown here for a second because I know some of you, based on the first, you know, 15 minutes of this episode are going to say, man, how quickly did you turn on Brown? You were talking him up last week, Dono, and now you're you're completely off the Brown bandwagon. Nope, I'm not, okay? I'm not off the Brown bandwagon. And I, the, the Brown bandwagon, the Brown bandwagon. And I want some of you out there, please, spare me your big picture takes on Jakari Brown after this one game. Because I already see some Canes fans saying things like, wow, this guy sucks, or wow, these coaches already ruined Jakari Brown. 
take a step back and take a deep breath, guys. Getting your second career start as a true freshman on the road at Clemson is like being thrown into the lion's den. Nothing about yesterday from a Jakari Brown standpoint was surprising. Clemson's run defense was good enough that they could force him to try and beat them with his arm. And I think we all knew that Brown probably wasn't ready to do that yet. Okay. So no Brown's tough performance yesterday to me does not undo the progress we saw him make against Georgia tech and the progress I've seen him make since he arrived in January as an early enrollee. So I'm not rats off a ship on Jakari Brown. I think the young man still has a very bright future, but Clemson was able to expose and magnify his limitations, okay? And honestly, none of us should be too surprised by that, strictly from a Jakari Brown standpoint, okay? Now, as far as uh, as far as things like coaching go, Mario Cristobal, in about a week's time, and it's really already started, all right? But I'm going to say in a week's time, because that's going to be when the regular season is, is officially over. He needs to make a full and difficult evaluation of every player on this roster and every coach on his staff this offseason. And that evaluation's got to happen quickly. We've talked in recent weeks about expecting 20 or so players to hit the transfer portal, right? We've already seen Gilbert Frierson announce he's hitting the portal. Thad Franklin has announced he's hitting the portal. I expect roughly 18 more to follow them out the door. These players, they need to figure out if they want to be Canes, if they want to play for Cristobal or not, and they need to make that decision quickly. And listen, some of them, as we talked about with uh, Calvin Harris last week, some of these guys maybe don't realize they should leave, and they may be nudged out the door by these coaches. There's going to be a lot of turnover, okay? You're going to see 20 or so guys leave through the portal. 20 or so are going to come in through the portal, but not only does Cristobal need to make those evaluations on his player personnel, he needs to do the same evaluation for his own coaching staff. I trust that that's going to happen. I would be very disappointed if some kind of changes aren't made specifically on the offense, all right? Everyone's asking, well, most of you think you already know the answer to this already, but everybody's asking, is Josh Gaddis really the right guy for this? Now, even if you do keep Gaddis, adaptations to the style of play need to be made because Miami's offense is too vanilla, too predictable. I get it. He's been handcuffed at times by the personnel, but it doesn't mean you should be running this pre-World War I stuff every single game. Uh, Miami also needs to evaluate. Mario needs to evaluate because he's the CEO here. How much blame, if any, Frank Ponce gets for the uneven quarterback play? You've got to evaluate that. Does Miami need to hire an actual wide receivers coach? Whether you keep Gaddis or not, do you need to hire an actual wide receivers coach? Because currently, Josh Gaddis is serving as the OC and the receivers coach. I see some fans uh, trying to say that Alex Mirabal, the O-line coach, should be fired. Uh, I don't co-sign on that one. I think that's crazy. His track record is top-notch, and... To me, it's not his fault that the offensive line, more than any other unit, has been absolutely decimated by injuries. I'm not putting that on Mirabal, sorry. Uh, but overall, yes. Cristobal and Alonzo Highsmith, GM of football operations, they need to fully evaluate their staff. They cannot hesitate to make tough decisions in the best interest of moving Miami football forward, right? They've got to make whatever decisions they feel are right for this team to start progressing, because I didn't see enough progress this year. Like, I still am viewing the, 2020, uh, the 2022 season this year as step one in a massive rebuild. So, you know, my long-term outlook is, is not as affected as some of you. Like, some of you are like, oh, this is never going to get better. I still think my long-term outlet is good, but that doesn't mean I can't also admit that this team probably should be better than five and six. And some of the games they've lost should have been more competitive than they were in losing these games. So tough evaluations, tough decisions are going to need to be made. I'm going to do some Q and a on the other side. You guys have thoughts. Some of you have thoughts and prayers <laughs> after that tough loss yesterday. I threw out a tweet. And by the way, you can follow us, follow the show at locked on canes. And if you follow us at Locked on Canes, we will follow you back. And if you tweet at Locked on Canes, there's a good chance I'm either going to answer your tweets on the Bird app or I'm going to read some of these on the show. So I tweeted out last night, 
I'm thinking of opening the mailbag for tomorrow's episode. That's today. Even though I am terrified of what some of you will come up with, send us your thoughts. We will read your thoughts when we return here on Locked on Canes. Friends, this week's thrilling moment in college football is brought to you by Nissan. The thrilling designs behind the new lineup from Nissan are intended to empower drivers and vehicles that are as capable as the driver themselves. When I think of unbelievable abilities on the field for this week's thrilling moment, it has to be. Now, I'm not going with anything that happened this year against Miami and Clemson. So we're going to step into the DeLorean. We're going to go into the time machine back to October 2nd, 2010. That was the last time the Miami Hurricanes beat the Clemson Tigers. Second quarter. Hurricanes were down 14-7 to at Death Valley. Third down and five from Miami's 35-yard line. Ja'Cory Harris, remember him? Hits Leonard Hankerson for a 65-yard touchdown pass to tie the game at 14. And the Canes never looked back. Miami went on to win the game 30-21 to against Clemson. Uh, hopefully, I don't have to wait another 12 years for a moment like that. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all-new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. You know I love those Pathfinders. They're all available now at NissanUSA.com. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube so, yeah, I um, mean, you know, unfortunate bits of, uh, of execution there. Jakari Brown missing Restrepo, uh, Jaleel Skinner not catching that uh, that Jake Garcia throw in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, I was it was, you know, shuffling the quarterbacks yesterday. I, I don't I don't really blame the coaches for doing that, because at that point it was very stagnant with Brown. They were trying to get a spark. I also think Jakari Brown is emotionally mature enough to get through that. I don't think that that's going to ruin his psyche or anything and he did get a few snaps uh still in that game to run the football and did pick up a first down with his legs and it was it was nice to see uh Garcia score a touchdown although that throw to Khalil Brantley wasn't the best but Brantley and I'm so happy to see him score made a beautiful catch on that in the end zone because the catch was a lot better than the throw in that case uh so now you know we all have the question who starts against Pittsburgh if Tyler Van Dyke is fully healthy, I would start Tyler because I, I think trying to get, to me, bowl eligibility is important. Some of you don't care about it, as we'll get to in the questions. To me, it's important. Uh, you want to win that game if you can. If Tyler is healthy, I play Tyler. If not, I probably play Brown. Um, so, yeah, I tweeted out, thinking of opening the mailbag for tomorrow's episode, even though I'm terrified of what some of you will come up with. Send us your thoughts. Let me read some of these. Mother Pucker writes into us, emphasis on the P there. Uh, he says, well, my thoughts are turn the page one more time and get ready for next week. Uh, that's probably also Mario's thoughts. Get ready for next week. Otto writes to us. Hopefully these are constructive thoughts, he says. No creativity in play calling, regardless of the quarterback. Nothing over the middle. No attempt at a running game. O-line played decent, but see above, he says. Defense tried to hang on the best they could. Number zero needs to sit, he says, uh, talking about James Williams. Well, and, oh, man, well, listen, from a strictly football standpoint, James made some tackles in that game, but his personal foul penalty, that's the type of stuff that's – I mean, you're, you're not a true freshman anymore. You're six yards out of bounds. You're slamming a guy to the ground. And, you know, what did you think was going to happen there? You're hurting your team. 15-yard penalty. Uh, and, you know, those are the sort of rookie mistakes. He was making some of those as a true freshman. And some of that I could say, hey, just mature, get over it. You shouldn't be making those same mistakes as a sophomore. I thought that that penalty – I, I mean, I'm not going to say unforgivable because I guess nothing is completely unforgivable, but it's unacceptable. <laughs> it's it's definitely unsomething. I'm going to say it's unacceptable for him to be committing dumb personal foul penalties like that. That 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 was really bad. Sedan Long writes to us. Uh, he says, "Hey, we still have a lot to be excited about. Lots of young talent, and we are the most attractive place for veteran O line and linebackers, especially at center." and weak side linebacker, which we should get a former four or five star at. Yeah, Miami's going to be very active in the portal. Very, very active in the portal. Uh, Kane Dog says, 
I hate to say this, but I've been thinking about this for a while. Ruiz giving these guys money and they're not living up to it like there's pressure on them. It might sound far-fetched, but something is different. It's not right. They're like spoiled brats. They don't want to try. Uh, there's no doubt that NIL is changing college football and it's changing players' attitudes. Uh, but let, let's not forget that, you know, I know Ruiz is the most high-profile nil guy in the country because he's just that's just his personality nil is happening all over the country um and you know there are certain teams out there that are still dominating miami's not um again i i think that players responding the way that they have it says more about the player in a lot of these cases you know when you've got parents complaining on twitter and guys walking out of practices and if anyone's not practicing hard because of their nil that says more about the types of players you have here than it does about, you know, Ruiz or about any of these coaches. So you need to weed out a lot of these players. I'm just being real here. You've got too many divas on this team. You need to weed out the divas and the drama. Uh, Mitch says to us, does Mario Cristobal pull the CEO decision and fire Gaddis, or is he just Shannon, Golden, Richt, et cetera? Does CMC change his offensive scheme and views and put these players in the best chance to win or die with the outdated pro style offense. Well, I mean, we, we all want it to be uh, a true power spread, um, which is, you know, G Georgia runs a power spread. I know they didn't score a whole lot of points yesterday, but overall Georgia with, with a certain style of offense looks pretty, pretty good. Um, at the same time, when you talk about the CEO stuff, I already talked about it a little bit earlier on this episode. I would be disappointed and surprised if you don't have, some changes made on the offense um, you need to adapt and you need to if it means firing somebody bringing in somebody new whatever CMC decides is the best thing to move this offense forward he has to do um, you know when you when you talk about the Ricks like Rick didn't want to ever fire his son Al Golden never wanted to fire his chum uh, Mark D'Onofrio who was just awful coaching that defense um, you know uh I hope and expect that Cristobal is going to make evaluations as a professional and not as a friend, because sometimes in life you have to make hard decisions. OK, uh, Nick writes in offense, put our defense in such bad position. That's why the score looks so out of hand when you're when your average drive start uh, is at the 50. You're going to score, he says about Clemson's offense. Our roster next year will look different. I have faith that coach will have this team looking noticeably different in 2025. Now, some of you are like, 2025? I, I, I can't wait that long, 2025? <laughs> uh, I, I, think even, I think even 2024 might look pretty good. Nick, I don't even know if we're going to have to quite wait that long. Uh, Miami Hurricanes enthusiast just tweets to us, I'm going to cry. That's it. That's the tweet. I'm going to cry. I'm so sorry you feel that way. Uh, Roosevelt writes to us, the team lacks experience but has great potential. Two more recruiting cycles and portal additions, and we will have a great appreciation for this journey. Amen, Roosevelt. I hope you're right about that, and I think you're right about that. Um, Neo writes to us, and I'm kind of in the same place here. He says, he said, this was expected, honestly. Uh, thank God they turned it over three times, or oh, man. And he says, oh, and yeah, the Gators lost to Vanderbilt. Stop trying to cheer me up, Neo. We're talking about the Canes here, not the Gators. But that, that was a really bad loss by the Gators, really bad. But again, I can only feel so much better when, you know, and, and obviously I'd rather lose to Clemson than Vanderbilt. But then the Gator fan would say, well, I'd rather lose to Vanderbilt than Middle Tennessee, and we could go on and on forever. That was, you know, tough, tough for both of those teams yesterday. Positive mind changes, writes to us. Game plan has been terrible. You are not doing your quarterback any favors. Luke Skywalker writes to us, the play of new starting linebacker Wesley Besaint. He's all over the field, he said. The play of the O-line despite being patchwork. So he's taken those as positive. I mean, O-line had a pretty tough time, uh, of course, but they have been decimated. Yeah, I got to say from Clemson's side of it, they obviously have a lot of good players. Jeremiah Trotter Jr., that guy's a stud. He was in on almost every defensive play that Clemson made. Trotter was all over the freaking field. I, I wish we had more guys like that on Miami. Uh, Pierce says we shouldn't even be, be taking tweets today. He says, wait another day or two for people to calm down. <laughs> well, sorry, Pierce. I didn't wait. 
Um, Orwell writes, I've been saying it all season. Josh Gaddis is the worst damn offensive coordinator Miami has had in 20 years. Well, if you go by just the stats, you could say the worst they've had in 57 years because the last time they put up that few yards was 1965. Oh man. Uh, let me see. Let me, let me read one more. We're, we're already, we're already going into overtime. Uh, let me see. Uh, Alex writes, you don't even want to know my thoughts. A couple people were saying, I will send you thoughts and prayers, right? I was asking for people's thoughts. Uh, uh, CLT says, after Pitt, do you think the team wants to keep practicing to go to a scrub bowl game? Or are the kids just ready to end a bad season? With all the talk of 35 to 40 kids leaving, will there even be enough players, he says. Um, you know, I think um, – it would be tough because, you know, not only you could lose 20 guys through the portal, you're going to lose, you know, some guys are going to be seniors and and may not want to play in the bowl game anyway, or may want to sit out to get ready for the NFL. Um, I always think the extra practice time is valuable, especially in this situation. Cause like by, by December, when you start doing the bowl practices, and that's if you get to a bowl, of course, you have to win this last game. If you get to a bowl, at that point, you pretty much know which guys want to be Canes and which don't because they're going to be basically out the door by that point. So I'd like to get together, you know, the, the 50, 60 guys who actually want to be Canes and let them go through an extra 10, 12 practices and kind of hit the ground running before spring football. That's just me, though. Um, you know, obviously the actual bowl game, you're going to be in like Shreveport, you're going to be in like the toilet bowl somewhere. It's not going to be a good bowl game, but I, I, I do. I still think the extra practice time is valuable. All right. Thank you guys so much for sending in the questions and comments. We'll read more of these throughout the week. Very, very tough loss yesterday. Miami falls to Clemson 40 to 10. We'll talk about it more this week on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.